and he's live. Did you? Were they done live in the past? Not yet. Not yet. No, remember we start we started Great Data Minds uh COVID, oh, right when COVID oh. started. So mm -hmm. right. All right. Great time to launch your company. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lordy V. All right, looks like it's ticking up a little bit. Yep, I think we're ready to kind of get it kicked off whenever you like. All righty. Well, Chase well. and Steve. Hey, Rock. <laughs> welcome. Chase is uh, Alation's channel account executive. Extraordinaire. And yes, Steve Berger, one of our favorites. And Steve Berger is a very passionate data culture advocate from Malaysian. Um, you know, Julie, we hear so much about companies striving and failing to become a data-driven, transformed organization, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you what, data catalogs are a very a, a critical component for enabling that kind of transformation. Um, and, and also, a huge enabler of data literacy, which is a fundamental element of that transformation. Um, yep. And the other thing is governance, governance, governance is coming at us hot and heavy with all the regulations. So I'll tell you what, this is not your grandma's data catalog. Julie nope, Harrell's. it isn't, it, it isn't. isn't. You know, so with that, Chase, I would like you to take it. Chase, I wanted to say a couple of things though. Mike. Yeah. Yes. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, this is one of our top partners and we, we have a lot of people that we've uh, put on elation and a lot of people we're working with to put on elation. So mm -hmm. um, it isn't your grandma's data catalog. It, it is used by some of the largest organizations in the world and also small organizations we see coming on. We had a, um, a small uh, organization in Denver that we worked with them on a, a deal and they're doing great with the tool. Um, it is at the heart and soul of data literacy. If you do not have a data catalog, you probably will not be a data literate organization. And then just finally, another trend we're seeing now, we have customers coming to us saying, you know what, I tried to use the data catalog on one of the top three cloud providers, and it is not functional. I think when you start to see the UI that Alation provides and everything, it is night and day. So we have a lot of groups going out there and, you know, looking at these cloud data catalogs and even some of the, you know, smaller guys and they come back and they go, we tried. And so it's just, it, this is one of the most critical pieces of technology you can have in your data and analytics practice. So I think you're, you'll like what you're about to see. And now we can hand it over to Chase. Okay. Sorry, Julie. Okay. Bell. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> well, I'm thank gonna... you, Julie and Mike. Thanks, we appreciate it. We, we, uh, we've worked with Great Data Minds for a very long time here at Alation and uh, this event is one of our favorites, and we look forward to it every year. So um, my name is Chase. I work with Alation. Uh, I work with our partners in the West and Asia Pacific. Um, and kind of how we do this is I'll talk a little bit about Alation's heritage and the type of customers, the type of personas that work with the tool. Um, and then I'll pass it off to Steve Berger, our solutions architect, who will kind of take you through a persona-based demo uh, and show you exactly how different folks would interact with the tool. So let me share my screen. And guys, we're going off screen so people can focus on your two beautiful mugs, okay? Great, thank you. Um, let's see, Mike or Julie, would you confirm that everybody can see my screen? Yes, sir, we can see it. Excellent, okay, great. Uh, thank you all. So uh, as I mentioned um, earlier, our, so our CTO, CEO Satyan Singhati, when he pioneered this data catalog market back in 2012, he did so because he, he noticed a couple of problems um, that he was observing in the industry. Uh, one, data analysts, data scientists, it just it took too long for them to find that the data that they were supposed to use uh, to accomplish their jobs and to perform their tasks. So um, it was taking a long time to find what was needed. And he envisioned a world where you could easily find the data that you needed uh, to perform your job, but also where you didn't have to duplicate efforts over and over again. What he saw was that um, data analysts were constantly writing the same queries. Uh, they were pinging the, you know, the same people and, and calling the same coworkers uh, to ask uh, questions about which data they were supposed to work with. Um, and so he envisioned a tool where you could connect 
uh, data. And you could easily do things like search uh, and find what data your organization has available. Uh, and then once you find what your, your organization has available, how are you supposed to use that, right? Uh, how can you understand uh, how that table should be used or how that BI report uh, should be used? And then, and then ultimately, right, which, you know, which data should you be using? And I think those three pillars, data search and discovery, data literacy, and data governance has become kind of the core of uh, what Alash was founded on and, and sort of how we've uh, how we've positioned the, the, the growth of our uh, of our tool over the years. So I guess to, to kind of give you a visual for, for what those mean. So this is one of our customers, uh, Daimler North America. And this is how they've kind of organized their data catalog. This image on the, the laptop screen here uh, shows the Alation catalog with different domains uh, based on the different parts of the organization. So I know if I'm an analyst and I want to do research on our, our SUV line, uh, or our uh, you know, a new AV line that's coming out, I know exactly where to go to find the data that I should work with. Um, so very easily search functionality, just like you can go to search anything in, you know, in the Google bar or, uh, or in an Amazon link. Um, and then once I found that table or that BI report or that schema that I think I might wanna work with, um, I, you know, I, I need to know a little bit about it, right? I need to know, is this something that other folks in my organization have endorsed, uh, right? Maybe there's other folks uh, who have said, this is good data to work with, or maybe they've said, hey, you know, this has been deprecated, you know, come over and, and check out the, the new table. Uh, that's better for this specific uh, information. Um, I need to know uh, things like, you know, does this have PII data? Uh, does this have sensitive, uh, sensitive information that I uh, need to be aware of. Uh, if it is, you know, what what are the policies around that sensitive information um, and how I should use it? Um, and then ultimately, right, I need a place where I can kind of come and, and understand uh, the glossary, the, the definitions of what my organization uh, is using and the policies around uh, the data so I can make sure that I'm using it appropriately. And then more recently, I think what we found is that Governance has become an, an even bigger part of, of everyone's day to day. Um, and what, what we found is we, you know, we didn't initially consider ourselves a data governance tool. And a huge portion of our customer base came back to us and said, guys, we're already using Alation as kind of a, a, a platform uh, for our data governance program. So it'd be great if you could build out things uh, to help us do this at scale um, and help us drive our governance program and, and make our governance team members uh, lives a little easier. Uh, so more recently, we've released a, a, a data governance specific uh, app within our portfolio um, focused around exactly that. And great data minds and us have, have partnered for a long time. As, as Julie mentioned, we have a few customers where um, we've kind of worked together from the beginning to the end. Uh, and and you know, we like working with them because there's parts of this process that we do really well. I think Alation is a, a great tool. Um, and initially when a you know, customer uh, brings on Alation, we do you know, this initial implementation, uh, which we call a right start, which is a great way to get folks up and using the tool really quickly. But the truth about a data catalog is that the, the more use cases you tackle for it and the more people that you onboard, the more value you get out of it. So there's really a ton of steps uh, and, and onboarding and the, the implementation of a tool like this is, is where the magic happens. Uh, and that's why we like great data minds so much because they have become experts at creating success plans, tackling different use cases across the organization, um, continuously engaging with different parts of the organization to make sure that you're getting most out of the data catalog, using it for those cloud migrations, um, using it for your data governance needs, uh, using it for analyst productivity, uh, search and discovery, and just making sure that you're getting everything that you can possibly get from it. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, that the continuous rollout um, and, and helping your organization navigate how you should approach rolling out a data catalog. What type of champions do I need uh, in what parts? What are the different phases? Um, what resources might you need from different parts of your organization uh, across different times? So um, we loved Great Data Minds. They are experts in the data catalog market, whether it's us or someone else. Uh, they are the experts to go to, uh, to talk to about your needs. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Steve Berger, who's going to take us into the catalog and show you exactly what this tool looks like. Great. Thanks, Chase. 
Are you able to hear me okay, first of all? Yep, we okay. can hear you and I'm gonna stop my share. Fantastic, and I'm gonna share my screen. For resolution purposes, I'm gonna use my primary monitor, so momentarily you may see a very messy background. My apologies, I am need to organize that after some new initiatives are completed. So now you should be seeing the Alation landing page for a demo environment here. Chase, you able to see that and see my little mouse flashing in the four corners? Yep, looks good. Fantastic. So I'm going to break up the demo kind of in three stages. I'm going to do a visual analogy to something that was referenced uh, earlier in Chase's presentation. Then we'll walk through as if I were an analyst, and then we'll look at it from the perspective of a data governance or steward. So if you caught the slide with the super sleek looking Mercedes Benz visual, there was a quote from Travelers Insurance, I believe it was, it said, you know, we're like the Amazon for data. So notice we have this broad catalog wide search bar, something that you'd see in Google or Amazon. You have the ability to constrain by domains. You have these quick links, Chase showed that. He described autonomous vehicles and SUVs, commercial trucks. But really, I mean, we're all, very familiar with Amazon from our experience recently, most likely, you know, being at home with COVID. But, you know, that makes it very approachable, right? This is a consumer catalog that we all know and, and use by and large. Again, you can search across the entire content of the catalog. You can refine that search by domains. So little little fun fact about me, I still buy a lot of technical books from Amazon, and I'll show you why in a moment. Uh, there are those categories that you can search that are kind of always there, particular types of categories like things on Amazon Prime, new releases. But then there's also the ability to curate quick links to more seasonal oriented things. You can see spring fashions and uh, self-care essentials, right? So if we carry this analogy back over to Alation, we see that the organizational approach is very similar. Search bar domains that we can define and then constrain that searching by quick links, make it easy to get to resources. Now, if I were logged into my Amazon account, you'd also see links and recommendations and my purchase history. It'd be a lot of technical and automotive books, really. Well, with Alation, you have the ability to visit uh, or revisit recently visited assets. So kind of like, uh, you know, your purchase history on Amazon, I can breadcrumb my way back to things that I've used recently or searched for in the catalog. I can favorite or star resources so that I can return to them again and again. Maybe I'm adding insight and curation into the description field or something of that nature. And maybe I'm even more invested in those assets. I want to watch them. That's like favoriting them. But if there's a structural change, like a table is added to a schema or a column is dropped from a table, then I don't have to be a data steward who would get that notification. I could be that casual observer, but I would also receive that notification as well. Hey, columns dropped from this table last night. So once you kind of get that context, that's how approachable it is, right? We can we can get to the catalog now. Uh, there was a comment earlier about uh, agile data governance. Um, so true story. I recently went to look for a book called Non-Invasive Data Governance, and again, searching across the catalog, I get a lot of results that aren't in the context of what I'm looking for. So a quick filter, I get right to the book. Now, once I found what I'm looking for, the insights are invaluable, right? Information quality four and a half stars, that's 4.6 actually. Uh, that's out of crowdsourced customer feedback. There's a profile of the authors. I can see other content that they've contributed to, other volumes perhaps. I can see summary information about the book, how to access it. So I'm looking at a representation of it in the catalog, but not the book itself. So I may need to be granted access to that book. Now I'm buying stuff from Amazon that's purchasing, but in, in the data world, that's requesting access. But the main reason I still buy a lot of technical books from Amazon is that I can look at a pretty comprehensive sample representation without being granted access to the full data source, information source. Uh, I like to do this because sometimes books are too broad and general and conceptual, and I want them to be a little more granular to specific technologies, but sometimes they can be too granular to one particular technology, and I want them to be in that just right space of giving me the mix of technical and conceptual. So again, carrying this all over to Alation, right? Now that you know how to approach it or to kind of, you know, misconstrue a Steve Jobs quote, how to hold it, right? 
it makes it really approachable to any type of users. Uh, in addition to the search capabilities, those quick links that you can have your administrators or stewards curate, you can embed content like uh, videos. Onboarding is a huge use case, both internally at Alation, as well as in our customers, onboarding new analysts. So things like training videos, interactive dashboards, Chase mentioned the gamification nature. So embedding like interactive tablet dashboards to show usage or, or contributions or things like that makes it much more engaging. And then there's ease of navigation. You can click the left hamburger to reveal a menu that allows you to get to those sources or file systems or BI systems. And even the things found within the context of the catalog, like the social conversations in context of assets, they become indexed and searchable the queries that we pull from source systems. And lastly, uh, navigation by apps, right? So we can go to our data sources. You'll see the governance app in just a few moments. We have a built-in SQL editor called Compose. So once you find the resources you need, you can go right to querying them if you have access. Um, so very easy, very user-friendly and approachable. So let's put this in context of a persona. Let's say I'm a data analyst. Maybe I'm even relatively new to the organization and I'm sat down in front of a, an executive stakeholder and they're making a large investment in a new service product or offering. Maybe if it's a bank, they're getting into mortgages. Maybe if it's a streaming service, they're looking at investing in new programming. Well, when you're an analyst, you have the ability to translate from the business needs conversation to the technical side of things, right? So we're about to make this big investment. It represents millions of dollars and a high degree of risk in our organization was one of the first things you do in that situation. You look at the audience that you have, your customers that you have, and you want to understand their behaviors. And that's known traditionally as customer segmentation analysis, um, customer demographics, those concepts. Now, my executive probably knows that there's some BI reports. They've probably seen them, maybe even cited them that exist, uh, but they most likely don't own that data, right? So as an analyst, it's my job to go out and find my resources. And, and I know from personal experience that that can be quite challenging, especially when you're new. So enter the catalog and going back to our Amazon experience, we just type the concept, right? Customer segment, what do we, what do we need? Just like when I was looking for the book on non-invasive data governance, I just started typing non-invasive. So I throw that wide as possible net and I get all types of assets that are found in the catalog that relate to that search. And that relation is managed through our AI and our machine learning. So I see that there are queries pulled from source systems that are used and reused in the context of the catalog. There are articles in our glossary, so I can look for definitions of what a streaming customer segment might be. Um, we see visual cues around governance and data uh, information quality in the form of endorsements and deprecations. And we'll dive into that in just a moment. And then we see physical assets that we expect like tables, schemas, columns. We can even see social aspects. There might be a conversation that appears here. So uh, here's a conversation involving Nick it alludes to a new customer segment model that might be of interest to me. And that actually does play into our demo persona here. So if we go back to my story though, maybe I just wanna start with the BI reporting that already exists and turn that over to my uh, stakeholder. Maybe we just go find the bar chart that they had seen in a previous meeting and start there. So if I go through and filter this down to BI reports, I see, oh, there's a bar chart. They mentioned that they'd seen customer segmentation of bar chart, but hold up a minute. There's a deprecation on this and there's a warning. So that could be problematic, but let's investigate, right? So this is now the page for that BI report. And if I expand the, the flagging, say that, oh, this is an old segmentation model. There's a new one. And Martha a Steward that's curated this message for my benefit has even included a link to the page for the report that I should use. That's quite kind. And honestly, if I was diligent, I should probably just go straight to that and, and leave well enough alone. But I'm not, I'm curious to a fault. So I wanna explore a little more about why I'm being told no. Well, another thing I observe is this warning. This is a data quality warning. So what this is telling me is not only is this report itself deprecated because it reflects an old model, but some of the data feeding that. So even if this deprecation on the report itself wasn't present, I would still be getting notified that, hey, some upstream source of data that populates this BI report is, has been deprecated. There's a problem. And in fact, we can even see this visually by examining the lineage view. 
if I go to full screen so y'all can see this a little better, what we're looking at here is the BI uh, visualization and its associated deprecation is indicated by that little red stop sign. We can see the BI data source. So this is the data source curated within the BI tool to support the visualization. That's something that's a pretty standard function, whether it's Tableau or Power BI or Looker. Um, and what has happened is somewhere in the past, one of the BI analysts created this to support this. And in, in so doing, when they created it, they joined these three tables from a data warehouse. Maybe it's a cloud data warehouse like Snowflake or Redshift. And we see the source of that yellow warning that there's a deprecation on this particular table in the, in the data warehouse. So now I know that I really can't trust this because there's problems in the source data and problems with the model in the BI analysis itself. So I'll close that and I'll take my friend Martha's sage advice and I'll go over to the BI report um, that looks more promising, but there's still a warning. So what does this mean? Is this trouble for us? No, it's not a data quality issue. It's now more of a governance message. And, and in a moment, I'm gonna switch over to that governance persona. But this is saying that there's a document in our glossary that describes why this is subject to something like a PII data policy. So again, if I'm a newer analyst, to an organization, maybe I've not been through any formal training like HIPAA certification or, or even our internal policies, but within the context of my search for data and the glossary in, in, within the catalog, I can read those rules and the rules of the road, that information. And again, as I showed you earlier, that kind of training could be also embedded as videos and things of that nature. But the important thing is that I don't hit a brick wall with my research and discovery of data uh, simply because I don't know how to use this data within the context of the rules, uh, either company or, or compliance uh, regulatory rules. They're documented for me alongside the catalog. So kind of long story short, this, this is the right BI report. Maybe I turn it over to my stakeholder and say, you know, launch into the Tableau server and take a look at this BI report. And let me know if this is the analysis that you need. And everybody's happy. And that's that, that, that analyst motion, right? That find search and discovery. That was like the genesis of our product. Chase mentioned our CEO, um, you know, Satyan, you know, that was a problem he wanted to solve for the world. And it actually came out of a conversation he had at a, at a happy hour in Silicon Valley. And as Chase mentioned, now, you know, that was our original intent. We didn't really, on the early days, focus the product or even really weren't comfortable saying, well, it's a governance tool until our customers and our partners start coming to us saying, it is the perfect governance tool because traditional governance tools are very compliance and lockdown driven. But that really means that they're not adopted by the broadest pop possible audience because those people are restricted from seeing or even, you know, not just accessing, but even being aware of data that, that they're restricted from. A catalog as it functions in the form of like an Amazon allows that discovery and that insight and then can control access. So initially our governance approach was very kind of um, passive, I would say. We had the ability to embed uh, the documentation so you knew the rules of the road. Um, there are even the ability to customize fields. So as I transition now into the persona of a, of a governance, let's say my function as a data steward being assigned in the catalog is to go through the data governance project workflow. Well, we always had the ability to create these custom fields. So oftentimes those early stage customers that started leveraging us as a platform for governance would reflect their governance workflow steps in assignment to stewards with these custom fields. So here's a perfect example. You look at uh, the persons using this, uh, let's go to a table actually, rather than using a BI report, because it, it shows this in a little more robust manner, but the same thing's in place for both. So you see, uh, well, let me just search for a table. I know one that works quite well for this example. Let's use uh, diagnosis and use some patient information. So we have a table describing diagnostic, diagnostic related grouping codes. So again, I'm a data governance resource in the form of a catalog steward. Um, 
perhaps it's my job. See, and I was recruited from this by the fact that Alicia exposed top users. Those are the people that frequently query this data. And from that, like our friend GT here, promoted to that stewardship role. Now, does that mean that I'm getting a lot more work added to my plate? No, and, and with the gamification aspects, it actually creates this virtuous cycle. So one of the things I might need to do as the steward for this object is go to this custom field and determine, since I'm the subject matter expert, I use this data a lot, does this contain personally identifiable information? Now in this example, there's a workflow in place that prohibits me from actually making that change, but I can suggest the change. But once it's been labeled as yes, there's things like provider, provider ID and provider name, this contains PII, then the next step in this, this process might be that a, a, a governance official then comes and completes the review and puts the appropriate flag. And again, this was always functionality that was there that we didn't necessarily create for governance, but then lent itself very well to this this more agile form of governance. But as Chase mentioned, our customers started coming to us saying more and more, we're using you as a governance tool. It works great, but we want to formalize more of this governance functionality. So up until now, as a, as a data steward or governance official, what you've seen me do with, with regards to adding the flags and, and those fields is that very agile. But now we've turned the corner and we've formalized it. So now we have a governance app found in our governance tray. So we can extend the governance functionality. I can, bear with me while I drag my little thing out of the way there. Policy center, I can apply policies within the context of the catalog itself, or even directly to source systems. What you're looking at here is a masking policy in Snowflake. So it literally masks the information at the Snowflake level, but I can manage it from within the catalog by, for example, adding columns in the catalog and pushing that back out to Snowflake. Um, we have workflow. So you saw the end product of a workflow because I couldn't change one of those fields. I didn't have permission or authorization. I needed a request and that initiates that workflow process. So here's some examples of workflows, but this is how you kind of lock down the ability to make changes or allow users to uh, suggest edits and move through the process. Then there's stewardship workbench. This is actually one of our most recent additions to this governance capability. But as you saw me going through each one of those objects, like a specific table page, if I were to manually change that warning flag or manually change that field describing personally identifiable information, well, what if I were in the real world, a steward with thousands or tens of thousands of those objects assigned to me? Well, that would, that would be a lot of work. So the stewardship work bench is the area where you can facilitate those actions in bulk. You can do many of those functions um, all at one time and make it much more efficient. And the key here is that this curation action by stewards is kind of the heart of the governance motion. We measure governance through the achievement of curation or the action thereof. So if you return to the governance app, this is that final step. If I am the overseer of all our governance activities, I can kind of keep my finger on the pulse of it by referencing this dashboard. The curation action being the fundamental function of governance, we can see that we're in early days. And where have we been focusing our efforts? Well, we have 52% uh, of our data sources assigned stewards, but maybe we need to pick up the pace with tables and columns. Now, how do we know, like where, where do we go next from this? Well, we can go to this curate function and this assign steward tab, and we can see, for example, tables. These are all the tables that don't yet have those stewards assigned to affect that curation action to drive the governance initiative. And it's by popularity. This results kind of linear in the real world, you'd see a long tail, you know, but basically this is the most frequently used table in the catalog that doesn't currently have a stewardship, a stewardship assignment. So if I want to continue and advance that governance function within the context of the catalog, I can assign that table either to individual stewards or groups of stewards like a governance team. And we'll see that the, the count of objects with stewards will increase and that'll affect the overall governance scoring and capability. Um, I 
probably went a little over my time. My apologies. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. It looks like there's some questions in the chat because we do want to have time for Q&A. But really what I've just seen shown you is, is the very, very tip of the iceberg. As a call to action, we periodically have these sessions called test flights, both for customers as well as partners. And these are the ability to actually get hands-on in this demo context like I've shown you. So rather than just showing you these functions, you'll actually be able to log into a system and do much of them while we go through uh, the, the steps in a very hands-on manner. So my call to action would be to reach out if you're a prospect or potential customer to your account executive or through our friends here at Great Data Mines, or if uh, you know part of the Great Data Mines team, you'd go through Chase, but uh, participate in one of these as a next step to really get more hands-on with Alicia. So I'll stop there and address any questions. Uh, Chase has also made some content uh, in the chat about that. Yeah, Steve, that was that was great. Thank you. Yeah, I'd, I'd really encourage anybody if you're interested and it seems like something that you might want to explore further, uh, go to Julie, go to Mike, go to Joanne, and they can help coordinate one of these test flight sessions that Steve was talking about, where we'll we'll sit down with with your team, um, and, and we'll set up a catalog, right? And we'll we'll kind of go through how you might use it, um, and go to what building a page looks like, right? Or what uh, you know curating. Um, uh, uh, data that's just come directly from the source looks like um, and get your real hands-on experience because ultimately, right, the technology is just is just one part of a data catalog. Uh, the, the bigger, greater part is how your organization adopts it. Um, and, and if nobody's using it, you're not going to get value out of it. So it, it, the test flight's a really great way to say, is this right for us? Is this something that we would get real life value out of? Right. Uh, one additional comment in the context of the, the comments in, in the Zoom session. Uh, we, we were Snowflake's Governance Partner of the Year for 2021. So if you're doing oh, a, a... My bad. <laughs> oh, sorry. No, that's my bad. I put that in there. So I think you're going to be 2022 also. Oh, excellent. Good to know. So I went ahead and just predicted it. <laughs> the, 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 important, the important message there is that uh, we work very strategically with Snowflake and as do our friends at Great Data Mines. So if you're looking at a cloud migration or cloud data modernization, know that we're their choice they're a customer of ours they're an investor in us and uh and uh, look to us as their strategic governance partner um so you know take that for for what it was meant to be um so gentlemen i got a question um what's the typical time to critical adoption that you see and the reason I'm asking that, uh, Chase and Steve, is um, so many times I've seen people um, in the years past acquire big old data catalogs and they spend big years, um, spend years and millions of dollars and still don't have any adoption. So what do you guys see as, as typical critical, you know, critical mass adoption with your customers? Question. I, I think that's a great question, um, Mike. And I, so we've been doing this since 2012. We've been doing this a very long time. And, and we found the same thing, that there's a lot of tools out there <clears throat> where you, you go through the cycle, the organization picks a tool they want to work with, they buy it, uh, and then they spend six to 12 months uh, trying to get the thing adopted, trying to get it rolled out, and, and nobody's using it. Um, so, I mean, we truly are the easiest tool to uh, get value out of. Um, we have the quickest ROI. And the reason is because so much of it is, is automated. And Steve was previously a, a, a solutions engineer with our customers. So I'll let him talk to this in a second. But, but in actual implementation uh, of Alation, you're getting value out of it within that, that first and second week. Um, so that from there, you know, those next following months are all about getting more people into the tool um, to, to kind of just add to the value that you're already getting. But I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Steve chime in here too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to take what to build on what Chase has said, there's two aspects to critical adoption. There's technical adoption and then just overall user adoption. To Chase's point, the technical adoption is very quick and easy. Uh, I do a zero to catalog session in which within 45 minutes to an hour, I go from a base catalog and I connect Snowflake and Tableau and catalog them. So 
getting the thing stood up and crawling your sources. And when we crawl, we pull in first through metadata extraction, the standard technical metadata you would expect around taking the, the, the dictionary and the schema and indexing it in the catalog as pages, but as well as that additional insight um, that I showed, which we call, um, well, it's through a process called query log ingestion, but it allows us to uh, uh, display behavioral metadata. So by that, I mean things like popularity or who are the most frequent users or even that lineage view that I showed you earlier. That's part of that behavioral metadata we generate from that query log ingestion process. Again, for a source like Snowflake, that's something that's you know, we're talking within hours, if not in a day, just to initially get that all built out. So the catalog from a technical adoption standpoint, it's very fast. Uh, you're not writing connectors. We have a whole host of uh, connectors that we've created that you can even peruse the listing from a publicly facing web page. But then there's the user adoption. And we promote this virtuous cycle. So this, I talked about curation being at the heart of governance. Well, curation was at the heart of our original idea of search and discovery. And I, this was a pain I knew as a data analyst in my own professional past. But if you know something, if you use data a lot, you know something about it. People are usually knocking down your door that want to use the data because they don't know as much as you do, right? Well, that those users are surfaced here. And then there's the ability to add context and curate additional information, like in this description field. In fact, before COVID, some of some of our practices in our professional services org came to us from our customers, these things called docu jams, where before COVID, they would literally meet in a conference room and bring pizza. It was like an agile sprint to just brain dump what you knew about a data source, say, just put everything you knew into this description field. So my point to that as far as adoption and curation, it's, it's that virtuous cycle. Can you put a time limit on it? Well, it depends on how you want to phase this. You know, do you want to start with one organization, or one group? But we find it happens very quickly because people find value from it very quickly. Then they get excited and contribute. Once they contribute, the information gets better. So more people find value and adopt, and it creates this kind of cyclone uh, uh, excitement um, around that. So yeah, technical and uh, virtuous cycle adoption. Yeah. And, and the real value, of course, is, is the virtuous cycle adoption. Right. By the exactly. Yep. And, and as far as your competition, the one, one reason why we chose you to be our partner was because foundationally you had um, AI integrated, right? So we see the competitors, you know, adding AI or buying an AI company or something like that, where, you know, it, it just isn't the same. We see a lot of the, these larger platforms being abandoned even after they, you know, added AI. These guys had AI from day one. Yep. Automation. Right. Another, That's a, another oh, observation. Uh, go ahead, Steve. Sorry, if you want to respond to that. Uh, well, you know, I'm a technical guy, so I like to demo, but that's exactly yeah. right. So this is Ali, our relation robot. She's our mascot, but she's also the indicator of that AI in play. And just a quick overview. Uh, first application with AI was uh, lexicon context. So providing titling for the objects. If you've ever worked with SAP schemas, you know, objects may have German abbreviations. So if you're looking for a revenue table or a client table, it's not going to be physically named that. So uh, the AI was developed to start making this recommendation engine for the titling on the objects. But then that was expanded so that now within the context of the glossary, she, when I say she, I'm referring to Ali, our relation robot, can now make those recommendations and say that I'm coming across this abbreviation quite a bit, and it may mean last, I suggest you add it as a new glossary term or to an existing term. Here's how frequently it's occurring. Here are all the objects it's occurring in. So the AI and ML expands out to make it uh, easier to use, more complexity to make use of ease, uh, yeah, easier to use. <laughs> yeah. so, so we 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 <clears throat> preach continuously um, because we believe in lean. So everything's continuous um, with with our customers and our and our prospects that as they em embark on their data governance, you know, leveling up their data governance capability, that you stay agile in your in your your approach and find the critical data elements and continuously you know put critical data elements under governance. I'm suspecting things like popularity and some of the other um, um, information that 
the, the catalog brings about, including Ali, um, can help us start to see maybe it's the most popular data elements that we need to focus on um, putting under the, the right level of governance first, right? That's um, absolutely correct. Yeah, that's that's found in a dashboard that's readily available early on in the in the catalog lifecycle. Mm -hmm. um, and then things that, of course, are starting to tag as uh, suspiciously uh, needing governance or policies put around it, like PII, um, another critical data element. Let's get that thing nailed down. Right? Exactly. Very. And Mike, that 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 comes up uh, in context of you know of governance programs, but also cloud migrations, right? If Good if your point. organization is approaching or thinking about a cloud migration. Right. I mean, you spend a lot of that that time on the front end understanding what do we need to move? What are people actually using? Um, mm -hmm. and, and Alation automates that with that query log ingestion that Steve was talking about earlier. Well, we'll crawl mm -hmm. through the, the query logs uh, of whatever source you're thinking about moving over and say, this is what people are actually using. Um, here's where you should put your focus um, while also providing lineage uh, for that data and saying, maybe it's not, you know, maybe not as many people are using this, but this, you know, if you move this, it's going to have downstream uh, effects on the rest of uh, your data environment. Right. I love it. Yeah. Quick insight into, you know, the thinking behind that. A lot of times when partners and clients come to us and say, all right, we need to start governance. We don't even know where to start. Right. We say, well, let's look at what people are using. Those kind of known unknowns versus unknown unknowns, right? So in this schema, we see these tables, decline loans, full loan details as the most frequently used, the most frequently queried, analytics, queries, data sets for data scientists, whatever. Generally, the rule of logic says that that's your most, that's your riskiest assets because they're most exposed. They're, they're used. Prado's principle, these 20% of assets are used in 80% of your BI reporting, right? So we need to lock those down first because they've got the most broadside exposure and present the most risk. Same thing as Chase just said with cloud migration, you don't want to migrate deprecated legacy objects from your swamp into your shiny new cloud data warehouse because you're paying for things that don't need to be there. And that by and large is where people start. Interestingly enough, I worked with a bank uh, you know, back in my days as a customer facing sales engineer, this bank had gotten into some trouble because some employees were creating falsified accounts to meet quotas. They flipped that logic on its head. They said, hey, I want to see the tables that are used by one people or used one person or used infrequently. We want to shine light on these things that might otherwise avoid scrutiny. So that was how we use this behavioral insight in the form of popularity, kind of reverse the conventional wisdom to, to shine a light. They had already done very well to govern those those highly exposed assets they were a bank you know they had regulatory compliance they needed to to, to get to but because of missteps in employee usage they had to expose that and then a one more example and then I'll, I'll i'll turn it back over i did a proof of concept with a hotel chain and they for the proof of concept we were going to use customer loyalty data set so we hooked it up the first day we did the crawl Boom, the top user list populates on the schema. There are eight names, seven of which are the people I'm working with. One, no one had any idea who this person was. It mm. was like, they were like, what is this person and why are they using this data? Uh, you know, thankfully, it turned out not to be a misuse or you know, malfeasance. It was an employee outside the organization that was well intended, but they had had zero visibility into that and, until we exposed that. And if that person had been up to no good, then they would need to know about that immediately. So just little byproducts of this behavioral insight uh, really do have practical, deep impact on governance. And it, it's the path to value, right? You know, yeah. I'm doing risk mitigation. I got people that shouldn't have access to that seem to have access. That's awesome, right? right. I've got very popular um, um, data objects or data products that are being consumed um, in analytics that are supporting very important decisions, and, right? So I want to get those important data assets under control, right? Under governance. Exactly. On, yeah. Love it. Visibility is 90% of governance, right? Yeah. I, I have a slide deck. There, you know, was a, a, a famous 
famous uh, member of the Bush administration that, that talked about the unknown unknowns versus known unknowns, right? But there mm. really is. Visibility is 90% of governance. If you don't know you have it, you can't govern it. So, And we did get a question from Hassan. Thank you, Hassan. Um, yeah. Would I be able to implement Alation, um, the cataloging and governance, uh, seamlessly over the top of my data fabric architecture? Yeah, fantastic question. And that is a topic that is very much of the moment. And the answer is yes. In fact, we have some blog posts and presentation, recorded presentations specifically around data mesh and data fabric. And without, unfortunately, because of the time constraint going to a lengthy conversation around it, simply put, yes, we're the perfect platform for that because all the different sources that could be a part of your fabric, be they relational, on-premise, cloud, file systems, even API resources can be cataloged, centralized, and exposed in the catalog platform and then curated and governed as a function from there. So absolutely, yes, we are positioned very well to be a part of a fabric or a mesh. And just to, just to add on that, Steve, I mean, obviously we all hear a lot about data fabric and, and data mesh right now. And, you know, if I just go to kind of how, how Gartner defines, let me share my screen real quick. Yeah, um, sharing mine. You know, a data fabric architecture, and this is just you know, Gartner a blog post that Gartner posted on. It. Data catalog is is kind of like right there at that core. So it's the second bar here. On like if you're building out a comprehensive data fabric, here are the pieces uh, that you need. And they're saying data cataloging is is one of the most one of the biggest key pillars of that. So um, we totally agree, uh, and, and a lot of our team is focused on you know when. When, when organizations are switching towards uh, this type of methodology, how can we best support it? Yeah. Can you share that link? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Chase. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Yep, great, thank great you. I love your technology. Yeah, we always love working with you guys. And thanks for joining us again this year. We'll see you next year. Thanks for sure. Fun. Sounds good. Thank You're you all. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, and we'll see you in 15 minutes, right, Helium? Yeah, we got good old data robot coming up next. Cheers. That's a good all one. Right. See you guys. Bye-bye. We'll see you back here. Thanks, everybody.